Hello all, welcome to Shankarayas Academy Daily News Discussion. Today's date is 19-2-2024. Behind me are the list of topics we are about to discuss. So let's get started and get into the discussion. Look at this article. It talks about the recent farmer protest and the issues about MSP. As we all know, farmers from Punjab are protesting near the borders of Delhi. The government should address their concerns, understanding their demands and engage in discussions promptly. The first key demand of farmers is making minimum support price that is MSP legally binding. The second one is setting MSP based on MS Swaminathan's formula which suggests a 50% profit over comprehensive cost that is cost C2. Here the cost C2 includes all cost, family labor, rent on owned land and interest on owned capital. The current MSP formula accepted by the present government ensures a minimum 50% margin over the cost A2 plus FL. If the formula changes to cost C2 plus 50% margin, the MSP for almost all the crops could increase by 25 to 30 percentage. This is an important demand for the farmers. So we shall understand this topic using our mains answer writing approach. This is the mains question. Just take a look at it. What do you mean by minimum support price? How will MSP rescue the farmers from the low income trap? This is supposed to be 150 watts and will be rewarded by 10 marks. This topic comes under the syllabus GS paper 3. Here the question demands two things. First, we have to describe what is MSP and then we have to explain how it helps farmers regarding income security. We shall begin the answer by providing a brief definition of MSP. So this is how we are going to approach this question. Let's start answering. As I said earlier, the introduction can be about the definition of MSP and its objective. Minimum support price is a price at which government purchases the crop from the farmers to ensure that they get a fair and a remunerative price for their produce. The MSP is set by the government to provide a safety net for the farmers and protect them from the market fluctuations. This is to ensure a minimum level of income for their agriculture produce. Now let's move on to see the body part of the answer. Here we shall see about how MSP helps to secure a minimum income for the farmers and rescue them from a low income trap. Firstly, fixed remuneration. The farmers are financially secured against the market uncertainty. Secondly, diversification of the crops. The MSP announced by the government of India for the first time in 1966-67 to 67 for wheat and now it has been extended to over 25 crops. This will encourage the farmers to grow these diverse crops to maximize their income. Thirdly, MSP prevents distressed sale. Farmers rarely have surplus saving for buying inputs for the next cropping season. Access to credit like loans is also a difficult for small and marginal farmers. So they are forced into distress sale of produce at a throwaway prices and they are not able to buy high quality seeds, fertilizer, pesticides and tractor rent for the next cropping season which will further decrease their income from the next cycle. MSP prevents this debt trap cycle. Fourthly, it helps inform decision making. Government announces MSP before the cropping season for 23 crops including cereals, pulses, oil seeds and even certain cash crops. This advanced information helps the farmers to make an informed decision about which crop to sow for maximum economic benefit. Fifthly, MSP acts as a benchmark for private buyers. MSP sends a price signal to the market that if a merchant don't offer a higher price than MSP prices, the farmers may not sell their producers to them. Thus, it acts as an anchor or a benchmark for agro-community market. While it doesn't guarantee the market prices will also be higher than MSP, but at least it ensures the market prices will not drastically be lower than MSP. However, a lot is yet to be done as far as MSP for different crops are concerned. Besides increased quantum and diversification of MSP, the procurement of food grains must also be streamlined in order to sustain investment in agriculture and ensure food security in India. In conclusion, we can mention the way forward about MSP. Instead of providing MSP for all the crops across all the regions, the government can focus on setting MSPs for crops that are essential for food security and those with demonstrated impact on farmers' livelihood. This targeted approach can help to optimize the resources allocation. Government should improve and modernize the procurement mechanism to ensure that the farmers have access to MSPs. This may involve creating a more efficient procurement system, reducing middlemen and expanding the reach of procurement agencies. That's all about the discussion regarding MSP. Look at this article. It says that the 2021 census delay has led the government to use the PM Gadi Shakti portal for estimating the population of particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Three varying estimates of PVTG population has been emerged. The final population figure of PVTG remains uncertain. 
Accurate population data is essential for the implementation of government's 24,000 crore PN Janman package aimed at benefiting PVTGs. With this background, let us briefly understand about the census and PVTG. So what is census? Census is a detailed picture of every person living in the country at a specific point of time. This not only shows how many people are there but also gathers information about their living condition, economic status and social aspects. It helps us to understand how the population is changing over the time, what needs they might have and how the resources can be best allocated to them. Every 10 years, Government of India undertakes this task. The Office of Register General and the Census Commissioner is in charge of it. This office falls under the Ministry of Home Affairs. Also known that the Census Act 1948. This is the rule book for conducting the census. It was actually introduced by Sardar Vallabhai Patel. The Indian constitution explicitly mentions that the census is a union subject. With this, we shall also note that some important points and facts about census and its historical background also. The concept of modern census was actually introduced by British with an early amount Indian cities like Allahabad, Banaras in 1827-28. The first attempt to conduct a more organized census was across different region was initiated by 1836-37 by St. George. And the British government directed the local governments to conduct population returns every five years, indicating an attempt to systematize population data collection. This is famously called as Queen Queen Earl Returns. And the first non-synchronous census 1872 was conducted during Lord Mayo's tenure. This census was India's first comprehensive attempt to count its population, although it wasn't conducted simultaneously across the country. The first official census was done in 1881 under Lord Ripon. This was actually the first synchronized census. Along with this line, the socio-economic and caste census was conducted in 2011 for the first time since 1931. These are some of the facts about census in India. Now let's explore the concept of particularly vulnerable tribal groups, which is mentioned in this news. PBTG are the subsets of tribal communities in India that are recognized by the government as being most vulnerable among the other tribal groups. This categorization is aimed at identifying the tribes that require a special attention due to their distinctive culture, way of life and the precarious condition of living. The concept of PVTG originated from the Dibar Commission in 1973, which initially referred as primitive tribal groups. In 2006, Government of India renamed primitive tribal groups to a particularly vulnerable tribal group to possibly provide a more respectful and accurate representation of their status. As of the last categorization, there are 75 PVTG identified among 705 scheduled tribes across India, spreading across 18 states and one union territory. Among the 75 listed PVTG, the highest number are found in Odisha. That's all. So far we have seen about census, PVTG and some important facts related to them. With this, let's move on to the next article. Let's look at this article from Indian Express. It says that seven cheetah cubs were born in Kuna National Park. As we all know that Asiatic cheetahs were introduced in India through cheetah introduction project. Even though in initial stages there were some loss of life, this is actually the crux of the issue. Let us dwell deep into the topic of about cheetahs and Kuna National Park in detail. The cheetah is a prominent member of a cat family that belongs to a subfamily, Felinae. Cheetahs are found across Africa and in some parts of Iran. They usually prefer grassland habitats, where they have enough space to hunt its prey without any obstacles. As we all know, cheetah is widely regarded as the fastest animal on the land. Cheetahs are subdivided into four subspecies. They are Southeast African cheetah, Northeast African cheetah, Northwest African cheetah and the rare Asiatic cheetah. Having understood about the basics, let us see about the conservation status. C. African cheetahs are listed as a vulnerable species in IUCN list, whereas Asiatic cheetahs are as critically endangered in IUCN red list. And both Asiatic and African cheetahs are listed as in Appendix 1 of CITES list. Now let us understand in brief about Kuno National Park. Kuno National Park lies in the northwest of Madhya Pradesh, close to Vindian Hills. It spread across 748 kilometers, and the park lies within the Kuno Wildlife Division Zone. Kuno was upgraded into national park status from a wildlife sanctuary in the year 2018. It was named after the Kuno River, one of the main tributaries of Chambal River that passes through it. As I said earlier, this is where the Asia cheetahs were reintroduced in India. Coming to its climatic condition in the national park, the Kuno National Park mainly comes under the tropical climate. Geographically, this area falls under Katiwar Gir dry deciduous forest ecoregion. Talking about the flora and fauna, see it is mainly dominated by Kardai, Salai and Kadir trees. Coming to the faunal diversity, see Kuno National Park is currently home to the Indian wolves, jackals, leopards, chinkara and spotted deer. 
Known that in Kuno National Park, cheetah is the most abundant prey for carnivorous species. Then the gharial is also sighted along Kuno River. With this, let's move on to the next article. Look at this news article. Greece Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis will be the chief guest for the India's flagship Raisina Dialogue Summit. Interestingly, this year's summit coincides with the G20 Foreign Ministers meeting, which will be hosted by Brazil. In this context, let us learn about the Raisina Dialogue from the prelims perspective. We shall discuss it in a question and answer format to understand it better. First of all, what is Raisina Dialogue? The Raisina Dialogue is India's flagship conference on geopolitics and geostrategy. It is organized by Ministry of External Affairs in collaboration with Observer Research Foundation. It is aimed to address the most most challenging issues that are being faced by the global community when does it occur and who all participate in this conference it occurs every year leaders in politics business media and even civil society converge in new delhi what will they do yes they will discuss the state of the world also they will explore the opportunity for cooperation on a wide range of contemporary matters see the dialogue is structured as a multi stakeholder cross sectoral discussion this is because the conference involves head of the state cabinet ministers and even the local officials also the leaders from the private sectors media and academia join them who conducts this conference see the conference is hosted by observer research foundation note that they host in partnership with ministry of external affairs as we have already seen this effort is supported by number of institution organization and individuals who are committed to the mission of the conference lastly let us see the significance of the summit first it acts as a forum for promoting indian centric thinking secondly it acts as a forum for various international leaders to shape the global rule based order moreover it provides an opportunity for the private players to voice out the concerns of international issues thirdly and most importantly with the glowing global influence of the summit with the widespread representation of the leaders along with the discussion on the wide array of global issues this poses an ideal forum for increasing india's soft power this is all about the discussion on this article look at this article it talks about the study on stem cell the study found that the transplantation of lung derived from stem cell is safe for humans patients who received the stem cell therapy showed signs of improvement in their lung function specifically the transplant enhanced the lungs ability to exchange gases so in this context let us learn the basics about stem cells see the cells which are the basic units of life can be classified into two types namely differentiated and undifferentiated cells most cells in our body are differentiated cells that have a specific purpose these differentiated cells can only serve that specific purpose in a particular organ for example red blood cells are specifically designed to carry oxygen through the blood but the stem cells are undifferentiated and they act as a body's raw material that is stem cells are the cells which all other cells with specialized functions are generated they have the ability to divide and make an indefinite number of copies of themselves when a stem cell divides it can either remain a stem cell or turn into a differentiated cell such as a muscle cell or a red blood cell remember under the right conditions in a body or a laboratory stem cells divide to form more cells called daughter cells there are two main types of stem cells embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells that is somatic stem cell embryonic stem cells they are derived from the embryo during the early stages of development that is blastocyst stage they have the potential to differentiate into any type of cells in the body but at the same time it is controversial due to ethical concerns related to the use of embryos adult or somatic stem cells found in the various tissues of the body such as bone marrow skin and brain it has a limited differentiation potential compared to the embryonic stem cell and also responsible for the maintenance and the repair of specific tissues now we shall see the applications of stem cells stem cell play a crucial role in medical research and potential therapeutic applications due to its unique pro- properties and potential some notable areas of stem cell research and application include first is regenerative medicine stem cells can be used to repair or replace damaged or diseased tissue and organ secondly cell based therapies stem cells can be differentiated into specific types of cells and used for transplantation to replace damaged cells or tissues For example, hemiotic stem cell transplants are commonly used in treatment of certain blood disorders. Thirdly, drug discovery and testing. Stem cell can be used in the development and testing of new drugs, providing a more accurate model for studying human physiology and disease. That's all for this article. Look at this article. Recently, Parliamentary Standing Committee on Textiles submitted a report. It states that India needs a new variety of cotton seeds and plants which are adaptive to its soil and climatic condition. Moreover the report states that this will improve the cotton cultivation in India the report also states a worrying fact that in 2022 to 2023 India's acreage under cotton cultivation was 13061 lakh hectares 
the highest in the world but sadly the productivity yield was only 447 kilograms per hectare but in USA the yield was 1065 kilograms per hectare this shows india's ineffectiveness in agriculture production this is actually the crux of the article in our discussion we are going to see about gm varieties of crops from prelims perspective before entering our discussion let us be aware of the basics of gm crops see the gm modified crops or plants whose dna has been altered using genetic modification technology know that the gm technology involves the introduction of specific genes often from a different species into the plant's dna to confer desirable characteristics in the plant moreover the main purpose of employing gm is to produce plants with desired traits like higher yield enhanced nutritional values longer shelf life increased resistance to drought etc we all know that bt cotton is the only genetically modified crop which is allowed in india with these basics let's see about bt cotton in brief in this gm crop pesticide resistant gene cry1 ac and cry2 ab are obtained from a soil bacterium called bacillus thurgogenesis and used known that they are inserted into the cotton dna to make the plant resistant to pests and in such process the cotton's genes are modified and called genetically modified cotton varieties or bt cotton moreover it is developed to fight the infestation caused by boll worms the genetic engineering approval committee geac approved the release of bt cotton for the commercial cultivation in 2002 in western and southern parts of the country now let us be aware of another type of gm crop which is called herbicide tolerant bt cotton that is hdbt cotton the hdbt cotton variety adds another layer of modification to the genes and makes the plant resistant to the herbicide glyphosate c it contains cp4 eps ps gene which is isolated from a soil agrobacterium tumefaciens known that this bacterium produces a modified protein that allows the plant to tolerate glyphosate moreover we should know that this variety has not been approved by any regulators in india that's all about the discussion let's now look into the prelims practice question let's see the first question which of the following types of stem cells are derived from embryos during the early stages of development and has the potential to differentiate into any cell type in a body let's look at the options are option a hemiotic stem cell option b mesenchymal stem cell option c somatic stem cell and option d embryonic stem cell let's take a moment to answer this question hope you all have given the answer let's see the correct answer is and the answer is option d embryonic stem cell Embryonic stem cells are derived from embryos during the early stages of development typically at the blastocyst stage let's look at the second question with reference to bt cotton consider the following statements it contains a cp4 eps ps gene which is isolated from soil agrobacterium tumefaciens it is an insect resistant transgenic crop that can combat the boll worm it is the only genetically modified crop approved in india which of the following options are correct option a 1 and 3 only option b 2 and 3 only option c 1 and 2 only option d all the above let's now look at the solution option a and a statement a is incorrect bt cotton has genes cry1 ac and cry2 ab obtained from soil bacterium called bacillus thurgogenesis whereas the gene cp4 eps ps gene is used for hdbt cotton whereas the statements 2 and 3 are correct with reference to cheetah consider the following statements cheetah reintroduction project aims to reintroduce cheetah in mahadev national park madhya pradesh cheetah is the only large carnivorous to have become extinct in independent india asiatic cheetah is classified as a critically endangered species by the iucn red list which of the options are correct option a 1 and 3 only option b 2 and 3 only option c 1 and 2 only and option d all the above let's now look at the solution statement a is actually incorrect it aims to reintroduce cheetah in kono palpur wildlife sanctuary madhya pradesh whereas the statement 2 and 3 are correct which among the following statements best describe raisena dialogue recently seen in news it is a conference conducted by united nations it is a conference on geopolitics and geoeconomics it addresses the most challenging issue faced by the global community which of the following statements are correct option a 2 only option b 2 and 3 only option c 1 and 2 only and option d all the above and the answer is option b 2 and 3 only statement 1 is incorrect because it is india's premier conference and not the conference conducted by united nation it is conducted by orf or observer research foundation in partnership with ministry of external affairs statement 2 and 3 are correct this is what we have saw in our discussion right it is a conference on geopolitics and economics and it is committed to address the most challenging issues 
faced by the global community and that's all for today's mcq practice behind me is the today's mains question interested aspirants can write and post it in the comment section if you like the video please do share and subscribe thank you